Hi everyone, welcome to the Sacred Musings podcast with me, Phil Saker. It's the 1st of September today, it's episode 48, and today we are looking at how our lives are becoming more and more fake and plastic. So welcome everyone to the podcast today. It's the 1st of September. Um, Time has gone by very quickly, it seems. This summer has just flown by. And um, yeah, uh, here we are in in the autumn virtually. So um, there we go. It's uh, kids are going back to school next week. Um, Yeah, time just marches on. It's relentless, isn't it? You know, I think there was a Michael McIntyre sketch uh, or, you know, sort of routine that he did, you know, just that every year British people are saying the same kind of things. You know, oh, it's come up very quickly. It's come up very quickly, hasn't it? I don't know. Time passing is the most normal thing in the world. And yet it always seems to come as a surprise. So make of that what you will. Um, so today we are thinking in the main section about how uh, our lives are becoming more and more sort of fake and plastic. And we'll be thinking about that in a moment. But before we get to that, um, as uh, normal, I'll just begin with a few little um, uh, links, things which I've seen over the last uh, week or so. Uh, just things to highlight. So the first thing I wanted to mention was the new uh, album by Muse, The Will of the People. Um I mentioned a few months ago they released a single called Compliance, which I think is going to be one of the songs of the decade. Um, I think it is it is fantastic. If you haven't heard it, then uh, do give it a listen because it's you know absolutely bang on. I think with what is happening at the moment. Uh, but the album itself was released on Friday, and. Um, I think it's, I mean, it, it won't be to everyone's, you know, taste musically. It's, you know, kind of a rock album, quite hard rock, you know, and, and um, it's uh, quite heavy in places. But I think it's got some lovely songs on. Uh, the important thing is, though, that the I think the message of it, it's very thought provoking about everything that's been happening. Uh, the song, which I think is particularly poignant, is called Verona. And uh, that wasn't released as a single beforehand. And uh, this is a reference to Romeo and Juliet. You know, the first line is, uh, can we kiss poison on our lips? And of course, thinking about what happened to uh, Romeo and Juliet. Um, but I think that song is a reflection on, you know, is it worth being kept apart? Uh, because actually we need our human relationships. And it's a really um, poignant song. Um, I and I think it's not, you know, it's not a rock song. It's actually, you know, just a, it's a good kind of song, I think. Uh, it's non-rocks. I don't know what, what you want to, what you, I don't know what genre you want to call it. Kind of like a ballad. Anyway, um, I think it's well worth listening to. And uh, I would, I would say it may be a good thing to talk to other people about, you know, because uh, I, I, I think I mentioned this at the time, but I heard uh, Compliance, for example, on the radio. I've heard some of the other songs on the radio. You know, Muse are, a, <clears throat> you know, as bands go, they're pretty big. And um, it may be a conversation starter with with uh, friends and family who are still kind of thinking about these things and who, who've, who've, you know, maybe um, beginning to put pieces together in their mind in a way which they maybe didn't before. So it may be a good way in to talk about, uh, but I think it's well worth uh, listening to anyway. So that's The Will of the People by, by Muse. Um, there was an absolute barnstormer of an article by Lord Sumption in The Times um, a few days ago, which was just called, uh, Little by Little, the Truth of Lockdown is Being Admitted. It was a disaster. And this was written uh, on the 28th, it was in the Sunday Times on the 28th of August, and it was um, reflecting on the interview that Rishi Sunak gave with The Spectator last week, where he revealed what was happening when it came to uh, to the lockdowns. Um, let me just quote you a little bit of what uh, Lord Sumption says at the start. Sunak makes three main points. First, the scientific advice was more equivocal and inconsistent than the government let on. Some of it was based on questionable premises that were never properly scrutinised. Some of it fell apart as soon as it was challenged from outside the groupthink of the SAGE advisory body. Second, to build support, the government stoked fear, embarking on a manipulative advertising campaign and endorsing extravagant graphics pointing to an uncontrolled rise in mortality if we were not locked down. Third, 
the government not only ignored the catastrophic collateral damage done by the lockdown, but actively discouraged discussion of it, both in government and in its public messaging. So Lord Sumption just highlights uh, what was revealed by Rishi Sunak and then goes on to, to talk about it. Uh, absolutely well worth reading if you haven't. What strikes me as being interesting about all of this is, you know, this is Rishi Sunak was saying this, you know, the, the hopeful for the next prime minister. If he's saying this, surely it can't be long before everyone else starts to say this kind of thing. I, I suspect Rishi has said this because he senses which way the wind is blowing and he knows that, you know, the truth is going to come out. So he wants to say at the start, well, no, I was never in favour of all those horrible damaging lockdowns um, kind of thing. Um, which does make one wonder, you know, well, why did you not resign at the time rather than just carry on and try and influence when you could see that that wasn't that wasn't working? Um, but anyway, um, I think this is a yeah, it, it seems I think there's reason for hope here. You know, that the, the narrative does seem to be falling apart and that people are beginning to realise not just in sort of lockdown sceptic um, communities, but actually in the general uh, public that the lockdowns were a complete disaster to use Lord Sumption's words and I'm hopeful that that it will unravel it will all unravel uh, the truth will come out and um, that is that's can only be a good thing in the end um, the third and final thing that I wanted to mention just before we get going is uh, the Frankfurt Declaration so this is a new declaration Christian declaration by a group of uh, Christian ministers who've got together to produce a um, a declaration of standing for Christian civil liberties against all of the the authoritarianism that's been happening in the world and they've published it now it's online the Frankfurt declaration.com uh, you can go and have a look at it let me just read you a little bit of what they say about it a few concerned pastors from different continents moved by an emergent totalitarianism of the state over all realms of society, and particularly the church, and the disregard of God-given and constitutionally guaranteed rights during the Covid crisis, joined in common cause to craft a solemn declaration, which seeks to address these threats with the timeless truths of God's word. The following affirmations and denials, derived from biblical principles, we put forth for consideration by all Christians and relevant authorities, in the hope that this document will give light and strength for faithful witness to Jesus Christ in our day. So you can go and uh, have a look at that. I do commend uh, reading it and uh, signing it if you feel able to. I've signed it um, and uh, you can um, go and, uh, and sign it yourself as well if you if you believe um, that it's it's a good thing. I think it's good, especially for if you you belong to a church, um, a Christian pastors, especially to to sign it as that, I think, just gives a bit more sort of weight to it. But for everyone, I think, you know, if you agree with what they say, then you know, do do consider signing. So that was the, the three things that I wanted to mention uh, today. Do let me know if there's anything that you found helpful or interesting. You can do that on Telegram. You can do that on um, the YouTube comments or email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com. Um, and just to, to say, by the way, um, before we get into the main section, if you'd like to support me, you can do that on Buy Me A Coffee. Um, I do appreciate the cost of living crisis and everything. Um, and I know it's hitting all of us. So, you know, I, I, I'm just really grateful for any support that anyone uh, gives in, in any way, really. <clears throat> all sorts of different ways. But the link for that is down below as well. And I really do appreciate that. So let's uh, move on now to thinking about uh, our fake plastic lives. So this is the main section thinking about uh, fake plastic lives. And those of you who are of a, a certain generation will uh, perhaps instantly be thinking, oh, that sounds a little bit like that song Fake Plastic Trees by Radiohead. And indeed, that is a reference to the song by Radiohead. I was thinking about the song the other day, actually, um, for reasons which we'll come on to. Um, and I was thinking just how the song, I think, there is, it's quite a profound song. Um, I think perhaps unintentionally, I'm not sure whether Tom York intended it quite to be uh, profound like it is. But it's if you don't know the song, it's the story of 
uh, a woman who or, or a man who kind of you know just looks at the fake plastic tree that they've got they look at you know and, and it kind of expands out and they just realize that they've been living a fake plastic life that their relationships are kind of fake and plastic that everything in their lives is is kind of fake and plastic and uh, it's just got the refrain you know, it wears it wears her out and how actually to live this kind of fake plastic life is really wearing you know it's, it's tiring to to always have that kind of um, a fake life rather than a real uh, a real life um and uh, yeah i think it's a good song do go and have a listen to it um if you're interested i always used to think that radiohead were kind of depressing uh, slit your wrist kind of music but actually i've sort of got into them a bit more um recently i think a lot of their songs are uh, they're deeper than a lot of you know well they're deeper than a lot of pop music for sure and um, they've got some um, interesting things to say so anyway there we go um that's fake plastic trees by by radiohead um so it made me think are our lives uh, fake and plastic and what inspired me to kind of think about this was uh, and, and to think about the song was talking to a teacher friend of mine um, before the summer. And I've got several teacher friends um, and this particular friend was telling me about problems in the school, how there were real problems that there uh, there was a not a very good relationship between the the teachers and the senior leadership team the culture wasn't very healthy the teachers didn't feel trusted and she was even telling me how um, you know she felt um, quite down you know quite depressed about it all but even some of the other um, teachers had been you know thinking about yeah all sorts of horrible you know things I mean um, you know, harming themselves and what have you I don't I don't want to make it sound you know more terrible than it is um but yeah there were some there were some pretty bad things going on and um anyway I happened to catch a a, a glimpse of the uh, every year they produce a kind of leavers video and um you know in this video all the all the teachers you know do a um a thing for the the kids and you know there was all it was all kind of smiles happy faces you know looking like there was absolutely nothing wrong all of the the staff and i just the disconnect between what i've been told about what was really going on and the the video was huge you know it was like i knew as i was watching that video that things were not right and yet you would never have believed it from from watching now i know that you know we have to we all have to do that to some extent you know we can't we can't always be uh you know completely honest all of the time about the way that we feel but it really struck me at that point that this this disconnect between you know the way that we feel inside and the way that we are we kind of portray ourselves outside you know our public persona uh, if you like there was a thing uh, where my my wife at uh, the school where my wife used to work uh, called relentless optimism which is that you know you just kind of have to be relentlessly positive no matter what and i think that was very much that that kind of culture you know you just have to no matter what you're feeling you have to be relentlessly positive and it just struck me that this is just normal for life now it's not just in in schools or in particular environments but i think it is life isn't it you know that we are outwardly happy but inwardly miserable inwardly dead and i think this is all over all over the case you know people have lives which are sort of outwardly happy they've got you know a tv car you know phone smartphone uh, somewhere to live and, and so on they've got the, the physical things that they need but actually they they're not happy and there is a kind of inner really deep unhappiness um, in many people i think um, and this is just normal now you know it's not something which is uh, only only a few people have but this is just everyone really so what happened to make us like this 
uh, I, there are a couple of things, and I know I've talked about this kind of thing on the podcast before, so let me just run through this briefly, a couple of things. Uh, I think social media has played a big part in this. Uh, that we've become more disconnected from each other uh, physically. So we don't spend, particularly young people, don't spend so much time with each other in a physical sense. Now, when I was a kid, I used to see my uh, my friends, you know, we'd go and play football, we'd go and spend time down the field or exploring the woods or whatever. You know, we'd be together and through the summer holidays, we'd be together almost every day. But now, uh, you know, a lot of ki- children, young people, you know, they're on their phones. That's how they communicate. So it's kind of a virtual communication. And even social media, things like Instagram and TikTok and so on, they encourage, cre- you know, sort of curating a public persona. So they actually encourage this kind of thing where the, the you that you present to the world is different to the you that you actually feel inside um, so I think social media and the internet you know communicating virtually that's been massive on on our uh, relationships and upon us and uh, the second thing is I think that we in the in the world just in the workplace but um, all, 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 all over I rely less on relationships and more on uh, processes and procedures So, for example, um, we talked about safeguarding in the podcast last week, but safeguarding has become massive uh, recently. And it's very kind of procedure oriented that it's not about, you know, you you have a relationship with with people and you can spot if there's anything wrong because you have a good relationship with them. It's more like, you know, you follow follow this set procedure to keep people safe rather than having a relationship with them. So it's kind of substituting a process for a relationship. And that's kind of what's happening all over. I've talked about schools already. And in my experience, this is happening quite a bit. You know, a lot of teachers have got, um, you know, monitoring a lot now. They have, there's a lot of red tape being a teacher and so on. So, you know, it's, again, this substitute, um, teachers don't feel trusted. You know, they, 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 they must submit to the process. You know, they're not trusted just to get on with the job of teaching. And I'm sure you could you could say the same thing about many other professions as well. I think it's it's the same to an extent in the church, even, you know, that you, you, you you've kept an eye on uh, and not just kind of trusted to get on with it by virtue of having a good uh, relationship. And that's that's the main thing here. It's a lack of trust. It's not things which are not based on relationship, but which are based on contract and upon um, you know the the process on a you know, impersonal kind of processes to 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 function. Um, there's a third thing, and I haven't put this on the slide if you're watching on YouTube. But there's a third thing which I, I wanted to say, which I forgot to mention, which is um, I think things which have happened in the world over the last few years, not just COVID, um, but I think going back to Brexit. And even before that, uh, it's it's driven a wedge between us as well, you know, because there are so many political things which we are just not allowed to talk about anymore, that our conversations are not honest, because we are not allowed to talk about certain things, or or we fear talking about certain things because they're divisive, so therefore we just don't talk about certain things, and as I've said before on the podcast, honesty is fundamental to genuine relationship and if you feel like you can't talk honestly with people then it it drives you apart because you know the only way of actually forming deep relationships with people is is by being honest Um, or at least that's that's one of the things that you need you know you need to actually talk about what's on your mind what's on your heart and not uh, you know skirt around issues because they might be offensive so all of the divisive things that have been happening in society as well, I think it all feeds into this. And, um, you know, did it was it caused by social media or did it cause the problems? I mean, I think there's probably a bit of a chicken and egg situation there. I think social media has made things worse as well as being, a, you know, they, they wouldn't have been as bad without social media. Um, so that didn't make any sense, did it? But yeah, social media has made things worse. And uh, the thought has kind of struck me, you know, have we become basically machines 
have we become machines? Uh, this is a um, kind of like the opposite of a theme which is explored in a lot of science fiction work. Now, a lot of science fiction explores the question of can machines become human? And you can see that, for example, I put a on the, the, um, the slide there, I put a picture up to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. It's a book which I actually um, did a piece on when I, uh, when I did my GCSEs um, quite a few years ago now. But um, yeah, it, it, it became the movie Blade Runner. The story became the movie Blade Runner, if you've seen that. And it's about uh, these machines, these robots who are kind of so advanced that they are indistinguishable from humans and the problems that that, that causes. But we don't often think about it the other way round. Can human beings lose their humanity and become like machines. And I think that is actually what's happening. I think as a society, we are starting to lose our humanity and just become machines. I think we are becoming like you know, this kind of process oriented, not based on, on genuine human relationship, but just based on procedures, on steps, um, upon technology, rather than on, on, upon what makes us human, the connection uh, between us. So how then uh, did we get here? There are a couple of things which I want to suggest. The first thing is an atheistic view of humanity. And this has been coming for the most of the, um, particularly the second half of the 20th century. So, for example, think about Richard Dawkins, his uh, book, The Selfish Gene. I think that was published in the mid 1970s, possibly 1976, something like that. Uh, but he was arguing that we are, as human beings, we are basically uh, gene replication machines. That's the purpose of our biology. We are there to reproduce. And we are nothing but gene replication machines. That explains our behaviour. And, and I think this kind of thinking has led, uh, has lain behind a lot of uh, the science of human beings over the uh, 20th century through into the, the 21st, this idea that we are just a product of our genes, of, of our genetics, and that we are just there to propagate our own genes. And coupled with that, I think there is a, um, particularly in the, the philosophically, um, there's been this kind of strain of thinking that, you know, we are just deterministic. So in other words, we are simply complex machines that if you knew enough about us, if you could, you know, plug in our biology, our chemistry, the laws of physics and, and everything, then you could, then we act in completely predictable ways uh, that we are simply uh, machines, but just very, very complex machines. And that there is no such thing as free will, in other words. And that is um, actually not an uncommon view. In, uh, in science and in, in philosophy now. You know, the idea that we are just complex machines, really. And what's led us here, I believe, is a low view of God, or, or perhaps more, more accurately, no view of God. You know, that if you take God out of the picture, then it will lead to this nihilistic view of, of humanity, seeing us as basically machines. You know, the Bible says that we are made in the image of God as human beings. But if you take away God, you take away the image of God, and then, well, what are we? We're just bags of meat. You know, we are just collections of cells. We are chemicals. We are deterministic. We are machines. Um, and that's, that's kind of come by taking God away from, from the picture. The second thing which has happened is that uh, technology has, has uh, risen. Um, our lives have become increasingly technologized. So technology solves many of our problems and we, we are simply used to looking to technology now where uh, when, whenever there's a problem. Um, so if there's some issue with, um, I don't know, communication or if there's some issue with, uh, I, I don't know, all sorts, you know, for entertainment, for communication, for all of that, then we look to technology to solve it. And that has become such a big part of our lives. And even we interact, as I said uh, a few moments ago, 
we interact with each other more and more in terms of technology rather than interacting face to face or in a more traditionally human kind of a way that it's not to say that there is anything wrong with FaceTime or with interacting online on social media or anything like that. But when that becomes the dominant way of interacting, then we're only interacting with other human human beings via the mediator of the technology. And that becomes sort of primary. And, and I think that's what's happening, particularly for younger people who spend so much of their lives online now. So is it really a surprise that our lives have started to resemble technology, given that it's become such a big part of our lives, given that we even have this view of ourselves as kind of machines, that actually our lives start to look more and more like uh, machines. Our lives start to look more and more technological, you know, process driven, not driven by real human relationship, but, you know, through the... Um, you know, through processes, through procedures, through, you know, seeing perhaps each other as just units, as interchangeable, rather than as, as, as unique human beings. So how do we diagnose this problem biblically? Uh, well, let me read a, um, a quote uh, or a, a passage sorry, from Psalm 115, uh, verses 2 to 8. Uh, let me read this out. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. So what this psalm is doing, and this is a kind of typical of the way that the Bible approaches the subject, is talking about idolatry and talking about the contrast between worshipping the true God, the God who is there, as Francis Schaeffer would put it, and worshipping an idol. You know, the true God on one hand and an idol on the other and contrasting them. And the psalm is saying that the the idol, it may pretend to be to have life, to have a, a nose, a mouth and, and so on. But it can't speak. It can't smell. It can't do it. It is lifeless. It is inanimate. And uh, only God, the true God, is, is living. But the real kicker is there in verse eight, the verse which I've highlighted, if, if you're able to watch, which says those who make them will be like them. That's the real kicker of idolatry, that we actually become what we worship. We become like what we worship. And that is the sting in the tail of idolatry, that, you know, as human beings, we are made to worship. And that if we worship God, we'll become more like him. But if we worship an idol, then we'll become more like the idol. So if you think about it, uh, you know, an idol is inanimate and impersonal. You can't have a relationship with a, you know, I don't know, like a water bottle, let's say, for example, just picking up the first thing that comes to hand. You know, this is, this doesn't do anything. You know, it's good for carrying water, for keeping it cool and everything, but it doesn't do anything. I can't have a relationship with it. It is it's an it, not a not a, a person. And that is what what happens when we, you know, whatever idols that we have, it's an, an, an it. It is not a living person. So when we worship the God of technology, as seems to be happening, you know, looking at the place that technology is now having in our lives, is it any surprise that we become like it? Whereas God is living and God is personal. And when we worship the true God, we become more like him. We become more alive. We become more relational when we actually uh, worship the true God and when he takes his rightful place in our lives because we, we become more, more like him. And that's where true life is to be found. And the, 
The real irony of, of idolatry is that it promises life, but it delivers death. Uh, but actually, the truth is, the more we have God in our lives, the more alive we will be. The more we have God in our lives, the more alive we will be. That is the truth. So let's take a moment then to summarise uh, what, um, what we've been saying. We become what we worship. So when God is displaced from our lives, it will be filled by something else and ultimately destroy our lives. A pastor from America, I think recently retired, uh, called Tim Keller, he once said, everyone worships something. The only choice you get is what to worship. And I think there's a lot of truth there, that we are made as worshipping beings and that you know, we only get the choice of what we worship, not whether we worship something. So that's something, um, you know, if we stop worshipping God, then it will be filled by something worse. Uh, I say worse. I mean, obviously, God is the is good. But, you know, whatever, whatever we substitute in place of God will be bad. And that's the point there. Uh, now, this isn't saying that we should be anti-technology. You know, we shouldn't be Luddites and go back into go back into the pre-technology ages and only ever, you know, um, communicate by speaking to other people and not read, look at the internet or anything like that. But it's recognising that it has a place and that place is as a tool rather than as a master. And this is the problem with idolatry. Idolatry is, is, is not... Uh, idolatry is taking a good thing and making it an ultimate thing. It's not saying that technology itself is bad but just we shouldn't make it the ultimate thing. And this is the problem, that we need to, to put it back in the right place in our lives, rather than elevating it to the place of God. And, um, and when we elevate things to the place of God, that's when problems start. But if we, if we have it in its rightful place, that's okay. Um, so Christians should be people who are the most alive people and I know I've said this before, but I think it's worth repeating because it's such an important message, especially given what we're going through at the moment. You know, in a world where people are not really living, in a world where people are living fake plastic lives, people who are really living will shine out. You now, people who are really living life, it will be noticed. And that's what I think we need to do. You know, we need to show what people are missing by actually living life. So what I've said is, uh, prioritise spending time with God, uh, getting to know him. As I said, the more God we have in our lives, the more alive we will be. So I prioritise spending time you know, in prayer, reading the Bible, worshipping him, you know, um, get to church, worship with other Christians. Or, you know, if your church is still, you know, um, COVID central or whatever, then maybe even have a, a group with just meet with some other Christians informally. You know, and, and just sing some songs and read the Bible, pray uh, with them, have a Bible study group. Um, Prioritise real face to face relationships and get to know people deeply. Kind of goes hand in hand with the first, I think, um, especially when it comes to church. But, you know, we, we should be prioritising people and relationships. And that means going beyond, you know, the kind of the superficial, going beyond the you know, saying hello to someone and then not talking about anything meaningful. And I don't think that means, you know, we should have the same level of relationship with everyone, but I'm sure there will be people who you find it easier to talk to. You know, there will be people you can talk to about some of these things. Get to know them. You know, invite them round. Um, go, for, go for a walk with them. Go for a drink with them. Whatever, you know, just build relationships that are really deep and meaningful. Uh, and... Uh, especially with other Christians, you know, with those who we can worship together with and study the Bible with and pray together with and all of those things. You know, those are those are deep relationships and, and that's what we need. And um, the, the final thing I put is just to pursue interest and hobbies and be passionate about them. Now, something I've noticed is I think a lot of people are not really that bothered about you know, the good things in the world, they're not really that passionate about them. And I think there are so many wonderful and good things in the world. 
you know, there are so many things that you could be passionate about, you know, whether that be music, whether that be, I don't know, um, trains. Some people are really passionate about trains or whether it be passionate about, you know, I, I don't know, whatever it may be. You know, just enjoy the world that God has made, enjoy the things that God has made. And yes, be, be passionate about them and you know, be enthusiastic, um, because I think that is actually part of what it means to be truly alive. You know, as, as Irenaeus uh, said, the um, uh, uh, one of the theologians, the pastors from the early church, you know, the glory of God is a human being fully alive and to to enjoy the world that he's made, to enjoy what he's given us is part of what it means to be fully alive. So those are some suggestions. Let me know what you think in the comments below or on Telegram or by email and I can uh, look at that next week. Um, so let's. Uh, this is the end of the main section. Let's move on now to have a reflection from the Bible as we finish the podcast. So let's finish now with a reflection from the Bible and I thought today we could look at, at Psalm 33 and um, this is uh, because someone um, I, I know sent it round uh, the other day and I thought it was quite striking. Um, I was It's 22 verses. It's sort of a medium length psalm. But I think it's worth reading the whole thing. I was going to go from halfway through, but I'll read the whole thing because it's all kind of relevant. Um, so this is Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Okay, that's a lovely psalm. Um, let me just bring out one or two things out of it. Um, we won't have time to go through the whole thing. But the first section of the psalm, as you probably noticed as we were going through, was talking about how God is our creator. And it, it, the psalms talk a lot about that. I mean, the Bible talks a lot about that. It's a big thing. But just speaking about how God is, our, uh, is the one who made us. And he is... Uh, you know, he loves righteousness, he just, uh, loves justice, but he made everything and he is worthy of, of all our praise. And you know, he he is the one who uh, who made everyone. So we should all worship him and all of the nations should give honour and glory to him as the one who made them. And then we have these verses, the verses which I particularly was thinking about. The Lord foils the plans of the nations he thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. And this is really what I wanted to say, that you know, this is God's world. This is not uh, man's world in, in the sense, only in the sense that it's subordinate to God, that God has given it to us, to man, to steward uh, on trust. But actually, 
uh, it is God's world and his plans are the ones that stand firm. And this verse, I think, really struck me when you think about the plans of, for example, the World Economic Forum. I know I keep talking about them, um, but, you know, there are others who have plans which are um, perhaps not, not good plans. And uh, maybe you think about, you know, um, Putin perhaps in Russia or, um, as, you know, in China or, or, or what have you, who maybe have plans which are not good plans. But God says the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. You know, those plans in the end will come to nothing. Why? Because the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. It is his plans that will prevail. And ultimately, as we know, it is because he loves justice. He loves righteousness. He loves he loves love, doing things for loving and right uh, reasons and w- what we need to do is as we are uh, commended to at the end there we wait in hope for the lord he is our help and our shield now we need to wait for him waiting isn't a very pleasant thing to do if you're um going through a hard time i don't like waiting um but particularly not when i'm you know struggling with something and i need have to just have to wait But that's what the psalm is saying we need to do. We wait in hope for the Lord, for he is our help. And we we rejoice in him. Um, And I like the last verse. May your unfading love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Saying, God, we need your love. We need you to help us even put our hope in you. You know, just now, please help us now while we wait. And I like that too. You know, saying it's, it's a recognition that, you know, it's a struggle at all times. But we need to ask for God's help to be with us and to help us in the waiting, knowing that ultimately it's him that will save us. Uh, it is he who, whose purpose will prevail and who will uh, bring, bring about what is right and what is, what is just in his timing. Uh, so with all of that said, talking about asking for God's help, let's do that and let's finish with a prayer as we um, usually do in, in these podcasts and ask for God's help in all of these things. And so, Heavenly Father, we know that waiting is unpleasant in some some ways, Lord, but we do ask that you would give us the patience to wait for you, and give us that, that hope in you, Lord. Help us to know your love as we wait, and that you would help us to expect to see you to act in all of the things which are wrong in the world at the moment. And we pray, Lord, as we were thinking about um living life we pray that you would help us to be people who live life fully uh, live life to the full as jesus came to bring it we pray that you would help us to just become more and more fully alive that the world might see uh, what it means to live life truly uh, to live life fully not to live kind of fake plastic lives um, but to live authentic lives with you and we pray that that as people see the way that we live, that they will be drawn to you, to the one who animates us, the one who gives us life, and that it will be clearly seen uh, who is, is living life truly and fully. So please guide us, Lord. Please protect us. Please help us in this coming week. And uh, we pray, Lord, for your blessing in all things, and for your wisdom and guidance. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Um, don't forget to let me know what you think at Telegram or YouTube comments or email at sacredmusingspot at gmail.com. Also, uh, there's the Buy Me A Coffee link if you'd like to support me, and I do appreciate that too. Um, yeah, so thanks so much, everyone. I really enjoy here seeing all your comments and everything, how, and you know if this has been helpful to you. And I hope to see you all again uh, this time. Next week, we'll be back again. So yeah, in the meantime, God bless.